Terrier. Emily Thornbury. Yay! Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, let me first join the Secretary of State in congratulating the RAF on its anniversary and congratulating Prince Harry and Meghan Markle on their engagement. That's one Anglo-American couple we on this side well, will be delighted to see holding hands. <laughs> I'm sure that Prince Harry... I'm sure that Prince Harry, the patron of Rugby Football League, uh, will be joining all of us in supporting the England team in the World Cup final on Saturday. And I, for one, will of course be waving my St George's flag. <laughs> on, a, on a much sadder note, I'm sure the whole House will join me in sending our thoughts to all those killed and injured in Friday's horrific attack on the mosque in North Sinai. It is a bitter reminder that the vast majority of the victims of jihadi terror are Muslims. Uh, before I get on with my questions, Mr Speaker, can I ask the First Secretary a simple point of principle? Is he happy to be held to the same standards in government that he required of others whilst he was in opposition? Uh, Mr Secretary? Uh, yes, I am. I think uh, all uh, ministers uh, should uh, respect and obey the ministerial code. Uh, and I absolutely think that uh, that's a very important part uh, of confidence in public life. Can I also uh, echo her thoughts about the uh, terrible events in Sinai uh, and also uh, say that she may find it difficult to uh, wave the St George's flag, but I will be doing so for the English Rugby League team. Uh, uh, as a, as a Welsh rugby fan, I may find it even more difficult than her, but I will be doing so as well. Emily Thornbury. Mr Speaker, the First Secretary looked rather pre uh, pre uh, perturbed at my li line of questioning, uh, but he doesn't need to worry. I really am not going there. Um, I, I, I merely wondered if he remembered the question he asked at Prime Minister's Questions almost 17 years ago, when John Prescott uh, stood in for Tony Blair, and whether he could answer the same question today. So what's the question? The question was this. What percentage of new nurses recruited in the past 12 months are now working full-time? <laughs> I can't remember. What was the answer then? I, I, I can't remember asking the question then, and I'd love to know what the, uh, what the then Deputy Prime Minister uh, answered then. What I'm happy to uh, assure the Right Honourable Lady uh, is that we have more nurses, more midwives, more doctors working working in the health service now. The health service is performing more operations now, certainly than it was uh, 17 years ago. And that in particular, uh, in the budget last week, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, was able to announce more than £6 billion extra on health spending, uh, spending which will make the uh, health service even stronger in the future than it is now. Emily Thornbury. I thank him for that response, but since he failed to answer my original question, I'll do it for him. According to the government's latest figures, more than 40% of newly recruited nurses are leaving full-time employment within their first year. And it is not just the new recruit, recruits that are quitting. The overall number of NHS nurses and health visitors is down by 1,500 this year. And the numbers are now lower than when this government came into office. So, why does the First Secretary think that so many nurses are leaving? The nurse, there, are, there are, as I say, more uh, operations being done, more nurses, more doctors, more midwives. The health service is expanding. We have got 14,900 more doctors, 1,500 more medical school places each year. And we've got 10,000 more nurses on our wards. And we've announced an increase of more than 5,000 extra nurse training places every year. We are, of course, we have said, uh, in addition, the uh, Chancellor said uh, in his budget that uh, we would uh, commit to make sure that the uh, nurses pay increase, the, the uh, action for change uh, faces, agenda for change, the agenda for change staffing covered uh, would not come out uh, of other health spending. So nurses can be reassured that this government will continue to support them both in pay and in terms of numbers and that is why our health service in England is getting better. If she wants to look at a health service where things are getting worse, she can look, she can look to the Labour government in Wales 
and she doesn't need to take it from me, she can take it from the public, because public satisfaction with the NHS in Wales is lower than it is in England. That's the effect of Labour government on health care. To break it to him, but there are more nurses in the NHS than just those who are working in emergency and acute wards, including district nurses. They have halved under the Tories. And guess who picks up the slack if nurses aren't there? It's nurses in emergency and acute care. But uh, I, the question I ask, Mr. Speaker, is why so many nurses are leaving the vocation they love. Now, according to the R RCN, the top four reasons are excess workload, staff shortages, low pay, and worries about patient care. And according to the government's own figures, the number of nurses quitting because of worries about their finances or their health has doubled since the Tories first froze their pay. So let's get on to the question, with the question that was asked by, John Pres asked by John Prescott 17 years ago. He said that nurses at his local hospital were warning, and I quote him again, staff shortages are putting patients' lives at risk. So can he tell me, what are those same nurses telling the First Secretary today? Yeah. What I can say is, is that since 17 years ago, uh, and it's interesting uh, that 17 years ago there were still uh, significant numbers of years of Labour government ahead with all these pressures she's just exposed to us uh, under uh, the Labour government. Since 17 years ago there are significant uh, more nurses in, uh, in uh, post uh, and, and I, I didn't quite understand her point uh, about wards because she seemed to go on and off uh, the wards, but we know that we've got 10,000 more nurses on our wards where people want to see them. And also, if, they, if she's uh, interested in nurses' pay, of course, I hope she will find it in herself to welcome the tax cuts that were announced in the budget, the increase in the personal allowances that will help nurses just as they will help workers across both the public and private sector. This is good news for nurses. It was a budget that was not just good for the health Health service, but specifically good for the nursing profession. As I say, I hope she can bring herself to welcome that. Emily Thornberry. Well, Mr. Speaker, I noticed that he didn't want to talk about patient care at his local hospital. Could the reason be that his local A&E, according to the board's most recent minutes, and I quote, have st severe staff shortages in medical and nursing care, wow. means patient safety is being put at risk, wow. and the only option to tackle those shortages is to cancel outpatient clinics. Oh. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. At a public meeting tomorrow, to, there is going to be a public meeting tomorrow to consider closing his local A&E for good. In other words, in other words, all the things that the First Secretary has been denying. What are you doing to our NHS? It is happening on your own doorstep. Isn't it about time that the First Secretary got a grip? I am, I am entirely innocent in this matter. First Secretary. The, the Right Honourable Lady's grasp of the facts uh, is pretty shaky. The meeting tomorrow in, in my constituency is about the strategic transformation plan. Uh, I am happy uh, to assure her that I am entirely in favour of option one of that strategic transformation plan, which suggests not just uh, leaving uh, A&E services in the hospital in my constituency, but actually expanding specialist services there. Uh, I would strongly suggest uh, she doesn't try to think she knows more about what's going on in my constituency than I do. I suspect that neither the nation nor his own constituents will have taken any reassurances from that yeah. answer. But really, Mr Speaker, we have an NHS which is in the grip of a chronic funding and staffing crisis. GPs are quitting in record numbers. Yeah. Junior doctors are running A&Es without supervision. Yeah. Our nurses are at breaking point. Yeah. And all this is before the winter crisis that is coming. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, let me finally ask the First Secretary, what, is it, what does it say about the government's priorities that last week's budget could only find £350 million to help the cash straps stretch to the limit NHS cope with the winter fuel, cri winter, winter fuel crisis? Yeah, keep going, keep going. 
350 million pounds to cope with the winter crisis and was, and was able to find 11 times that amount to spend on a no-deal Brexit. Yeah. Isn't that the very definition of a government fiddling away whilst the rest of the country burns? Yeah. The, the Right Honourable Lady is determined to talk the NHS down. It's a, it's a Conservative government which is increasing funding on the NHS, so it remains the best health service in the world, as the Independent Commonwealth Fund has uh, repeated for the second year in a row. It's this party which promised and delivered more money for the NHS in 2010, 2015, and in last week's budget, where my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, promised 6.3 billion extra for the NHS. More patients treated, more operations carried out by more doctors and more nurses. And when she says, at the end, uh, that the government is wasting three billion pounds on preparing for Brexit. We now know that we now know that the Labour Party doesn't think it's worth preparing for Brexit. They do, though. They do, though, think it's worth preparing for a run on the pound. That's all you need to know about Labour. Mr. Speaker.